Chris Blackwell, uh, as you all know, is a, a legendary person in the music business. Uh, for over 50 years, he has been a, a maverick record producer, uh, launching and producing some of the biggest acts on the planet, including Bob Marley, U2, Jimmy Cliff, Cat Stevens, Craig Jones, and so on. I think what characterizes most is uh, his belief in talent, in belief in supporting creativity. Uh, he's also a great hotelier. He almost launched the, the boutique hotel movement in Miami. And he's someone who's got a true passion for Jamaica. And uh, that's why he's got uh, his hotels with the Island at Post. Uh, I feel very privileged that he's a guest with us today. And I'm looking forward to his interview with Sophie Roberts. Please welcome Chris Blackwell. Mr. Blackwell. We would like to induct you to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. You deserve it, because you built it. I don't view the artist as my asset, you know, it's more uh, I had an opportunity to, to work with them and help them grow. When you're not thinking necessarily of immediate success, but you're thinking of a long-term asset, it leaves that space totally open. I really love this island, and uh, I really found myself totally in the Jamaican record business, right at the very beginning of it, in my first three records all went to number one, so it was very encouraging. I want to do the same kind of thing, in a sense, with this sort of a platform, with a resort, hotels, environments where people can come to. Great to have you here, Chris, and you're an incredible ambassador for Jama Jamaica. Um, it really begins from the export of Bob Marley's One World, One Love message to every corner of the globe, and now with your very present endeavors with the Island Outpost group of hotels. I kind of wanted to start by asking where that connection begins. You know, where does your story with Jamaica start? <coughs> well, um I went there first when I was six months old, because I was born in London. I don't remember the trip much, but uh, I grew up in Jamaica. Uh, I went to school when I was eight in England, and I, came b I was very sick, and then I went back to Jamaica. And then I went to school again at 10. I was not very uh, good at school, didn't do very well. Um, and then I went, I, I, uh, I managed to get, my mother managed to get me into a posh public school called Harrow, which, um, and uh, I, I enjoyed it, but uh, they felt that I might be happier elsewhere, so I left um, <laughs> when I was about 16. But there's a really important moment in there, because as a sick child, you were exposed to something different to the high society childhood that your mother perhaps thought you might have been. Yes, well, when you're, when you're sick, you're, you're very much alone all the time. And, um, and the only people I really spent any time with was the staff uh, at, uh, at the home where I lived. Uh, so I really spent pretty much all my time with, you know, gardeners, uh, housemaids, uh, <coughs> people who were uh, working in the house. And um, over time, I, I became, you know, very, very fond of them, uh, cared a lot about them, and, uh, you know, was, became very aware how I lived and how they lived, and uh, 
somehow. Um, <coughs> I, I just have always cared very much for them and still do. And it's an obligation that seems to come out in your work and the way that you take Jamaica out to the world. I mean, you started as a water skiing instructor where I think it was at Half Moon Bay Hotel in Jamaica and you heard Lance Hayward. That started your recording career. 1962, you take Island Records to London on the basis you're going to take Jamaican music to the Jamaican community in the UK. And within two years, you, you got a superstar with Millie Small, My Boy Lollipop, is that right? Yeah. Now, is that a case of serendipitous timing or a lot of hard work, that period? Uh, well, somebody said if you find something that you really love doing, you don't work, work a day in your life. So I think that would apply to me. I really loved working in the record business. Um, a lot of it is what people would consider a kind of drudge job, which is going to a manufacturing plant, picking up the records, carrying them around, selling them. What, what happened when, at the time that I had met Bob, he'd had a lot of experiences where he had been, he'd made hit records and never got paid, and left and went somewhere else and made hit records and never got paid. So when he came in to see me, I felt that the only, uh, f firstly, I wanted to change the direction he was going a little bit because I felt that he was wanting to have a hit in uh, the uh, black community in the United States. And I felt that the music he was doing would, would, would not be successful there. And I felt that he would be more successful if, he, if we positioned him more as a kind of black rock star. Uh, Hendrix had already, had already been around, so, um, in my mind was, you know, there was already a Jimi Hendrix and I felt that he could... But your meeting with Bob, the yeah. when, what happened then? Because that was all about an unusual level of trust. Well, that, that, that's, when, that's what happened at the same time. I, I, when, I, when he came in, all this happened in my head during this first time that I met him. And I felt the, the best way to gain his trust uh, was basically to show my trust. And so I asked him, I told him that I wasn't so interested in singles, I was more interested in albums. I asked him what he felt it would cost him to make an album in Jamaica. He gave me a figure. So I said, okay. Um, I drew him a check for that and said, go, go and make the record and I'll come out in a couple of months to Jamaica and hear it. And uh, everybody said to me, you're crazy, these guys are the worst guys, they're troublemakers, you know. Uh, you'll, never, you'll never see that money again, that's gone. And, uh, so when I went out to Jamaica, a couple of months later, um, they took me to the studio, they, that's Bob and there's two other people in the band, took me to the studio and played me this incredible uh, record, which uh, I knew was going to be, you know, the start of something new. Because that whole idea of um, you have kind of a maverick approach where you give a lot and hope that something might stick and come back. And I use this as an example. You opened Goldeneye, James Bond's writer, Ian Fleming's former home, as a full-scale resort. I saw it last November when it was just finishing off. You then went through the Christmas period. I think it was quite a tough period, wasn't it, yeah. the opening? Okay. Yeah. Can you tell the audience, perhaps, how you coped with the hotel on opening? Well, we were supposed to open 10, 10, 10, which is the 10th of October. And we struggled to open on the 15th of December. And of course, we'd had bookings. And when we arrived, um, people were still working on the property. And um, look, it's a long way to come to Jamaica. It's a lot of trust, again, that the people put in us to come and stay in our hotel, a brand new hotel. And there was people hammering and, you know, uh, these machines going. And uh, um, some people quite naturally complained. And uh, I said to Nick Simmons, who uh, was working with, uh, is working with me, um, I said that, um, look, rather than uh, sort of give them a discount or something, let's just say to them, pay us whatever you feel it's worth. Because I didn't really want to quantify for them what it was to ruin their holiday by them hearing construction going on. I thought it was 
better again uh, to trust their, to trust them and uh, it worked out. And how many people walked out paying nothing? Um, I think everybody took a little discount, but they didn't t take anything like what they could have. They could have. How uh, many I, people I told have come them they back? could pay nothing. Anyone come back? Yes, yes, yes. They absolutely have. Um, I don't know how many of them come back, but it was. <laughs> listen, it, it was an expensive thing to do. Uh, it ruined our, um, <laughs> our finances for that opening December. But I think you know. I, I don't see how else you could do it. But I it's kind of the mark of how you do hotels. I mean, one, you have the caves in the grill, you've got Strawberry Hill up in um, Blue Mountains above Kingston, GoldenEye, and G Jam Port Ant Antonio. And one commentator called them anarchic kids, which I just adore as a description because they all are very different. They celebrate quirk, they cele celebrate Jamaica. Yes. And that requires a certain confidence. The cookie cutter thing is not yours. No, I mean, it, it's it's difficult doing things differently. It's more it is more difficult. There's no question about it. Um, but if it does work, it uh, if you are able to pull it off, it it it, it sets a new something different. It sets sets a, sets a different sort of paradigm in a way. So. <coughs> and I think it's different only because it's you know I'm, that, that's how I that's how I feel. I feel that Jamaica is an, an incredible island. It's when I was when I was uh, growing up as a child, there were lots of people from all over the world would come to Jamaica. It was one of the places you had to come and see. And the general thing was that people would say the three most beautiful islands in the world were Bali, Ceylon, as it was called at that time, Sri Lanka now, and Jamaica. But then you have a place that's had the Kingston riots, the drugs, the guns. You know, you, that's a tough story to rewrite, and you've kind of taken it on pretty single-handed. It is difficult. It, it, it is difficult, but... Um, a question of It's perception. difficult because you can't sort of say good news. The murder, murders have gone down from 1,200 to 800, you know. <laughs> So you can't you can't show any statistics. You you just have to do it, you know. And and uh, bit by bit, I think as people come down and we encourage them to go out, we encourage them to go to little restaurants. Some of the restaurants we have to tell them you have to book a day ahead so that they and give them the money so they can buy the food and get the knives and forks and put the food on the table. But. Uh, it's just so p people can go out and see and talk to the people and understand that really the people are incredible people, you know. And do you think that makes it different from any other? Because the Caribbean has basically been sold as a lot of white beach and a lot of sun lounges. And it's yes. not how you sell in and out post experiences. No, it's, it's not. But my, my sort of, <coughs> like um, uh, it's been said, everybody has a mentor. I, I, I would say my mentor in the in this business was a man called John Pringle, who was a person who uh, founded Round Hill, which is still considered uh, one of the best hotels in Jamaica. And he became, after he founded Round Hill, he became minister of, um, oh, actually not minister, but the head of the tourist board. And part of his advertising campaign was that on, we would they would never show an image of a beach at Jamaica. So he always showed images of, uh, the people, uh, the rural areas, um, <coughs> the, um, the um, cane fields, the coconut fields, the mountains, all like that. He would never show a beach because he wanted to deliberately to differentiate Jamaica, to say it's really about the people. And you've done the same in the way that you hire staff. I mean, I think I came across two non-Jamaican staff in my five days on the island with you. And that is deeply unusual in the Caribbean. Why do you do it? Well, again, I think it comes from working with the same people. The musicians are the same, same people. The musicians don't go to college and things like that. They're the same, they're the same sort of same people. So, um, you know, what, what I said with Nick, let's look for people who are... Is the sound gone? No, you still... Oh. Let's look for people who are characters. You know, let's try and pick them, uh, pick who are characters. Uh, we, we set up something, as I uh, said, well, Jamaicans don't move as a pack so much. Jamaicans are independent 
kind of characters. So I suggested to Nick, let's, uh, instead of having a regular uniform, let's have, uh, you know, a, a black pants, a white pants, and three color shirts, the same style of shirts, and anybody can come and what, wear whatever they like. So then they're not having to be like in a uniform. Now, there can be an occasion where there's an event we're happening and we say to everybody, well, today you, everybody wears red shirts or something. But you break all the rules. You're, I love the story about um, you don't like air conditioning <laughs> and you're trying to educate your customers about air conditioning. Maybe you can share how you do that. Well, I think a big part of visiting Jamaica is the sensory feeling, the, the, the sounds that you hear the night sounds, all the crickets, um, the birds, the sea. And when you have air conditioning, you cut that out. You c That's just my personal, obviously, you know, um, that is one thing Nick and I disagree on a lot. He loves his air conditioning. <laughs> I hate it for that reason. And I also hate it because of the cost. And Jamaica has incredibly high uh, power rates, and the cost of air conditioning is very high, so I thought, well, Let's offer a $25 uh, dollar a night discount to anybody who doesn't use the air conditioning. So I don't know if anybody sneaks out in the middle of the night and switches it on. And, and it on works. And <laughs> yes, it works. It works. <laughs> the other thing that I um, enjoy about your resorts, you have some very big villas within some of the properties, but you're not trying to sell on the basis of the kind of the super villa, which is where the industry is tending to go. Can you perhaps describe for us what is your perfect room and where it all began? Because I think it's quite particular. Well, f for me perf personally, I like small places. It's just my personal thing. Uh, so there was a hotel in, uh, in the grill that I went to stay probably about 20 years ago. And, and they had these huts. And I stayed in one of the huts. And I loved the feeling of the hut so much. It's, it's, it's not very big. It's only about uh, 17 feet, uh, six, six, di six, six meters in diameter, about. <coughs> um, so it's octagonal, with a little part off for a bathroom, a little part off for a veranda, patio. And uh, so that's basically where I, bui where I built, uh, wh where I live at GoldenEye. And it's also some of, some of the accommodations there are the huts. It's kind of got a perfect ergonomic. Yeah. It works. It's, it's, I think it's sort of primal living, actually. Because you spend a lot of time thinking about things, and so much as you've owned GoldenEye, I think, since 1976. You've said before that patience is something you're good at. You learn in the record industry where people take forever just to tune their guitar. That's right. 1976, you opened up GoldenEye last year. It was is what it is, and it's going to be something more. Can you perhaps share why you spent that time and what you see it will become in the future? Well, s some of the reason I spent the time was because I had a, I had a, a more active day job. I, it was only in, in 1989 that I sold my record business and really started to concentrate on uh, the hotel business. But uh, I wanted to, again, sort of forge a strong relationship with the community. So we started the Oricabessa Foundation, really so there could be a forum so we could uh, invite people. I, uh, not that many come, actually, but everybody is invited. Um, so that we can tell them what we're doing, what our plans are, what we're thinking of doing, and also so that we let them know when there's going to be some construction work so that we want to employ the people in the community. <coughs> I believe very, very much in, in building uh, bridges rather than building walls. I don't believe in... Uh, Doesn't that do F&B a little bit of damage if you're letting them out into the... the well, it, 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 it does a little bit. It does a little bit. But I think in the long run it works because I think we have just initially... I mean, GoldenEye has been going before we just opened now. It was going on a smaller level before. Mm. But people come back and come back and come back. And I think part of it is because they've got to know maybe one of the couple of the people, uh, waiters or the house, housekeeper, or, or they've gone and, and visited this little fish restaurant down the street, or they've gone. Because <coughs> we, we, have, um, we have, with this Orcabessa Foundation also, has put money into sport 
and other, particularly sport, but other education and other things in Jamaica. So a, a, a lot of people, more and more interestingly, recently, want to take, especially when they come with children, want to take their children and go and see what is happening in the community, what the foundation is doing. There's more and more of interest in that, which is something which has really just actually happened in the last three or four years. And something that perhaps you will gather momentum with your plans for Patrapant, which is your yeah. home up in the cockpit mountains. It's incredible, 800 acre pot herds of pole and Brahmin cattle. And you have plans for that to do with Yes, well, there's, there's two elements of it. One is that that's where we're, we're growing the food. We grow a lot of food for our properties from that, from that farm. <coughs> and also, each property buys from food from local farmers. Again, in most of the Caribbean, the food is flown in by 747 every day from Florida. Jamaica is a place that has, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's an incredible island. It's incredible uh, fertile soil. You can grow anything there because the mountains go up to 7,000 feet. <coughs> so you can grow pretty much anything. So what I'm really wanting to do is bring people into our properties and feed them Jamaican food, Jamaican cuisine. Jamaican cuisine is fantastic, but people, when they visit, don't get it mm. in, in most of the big properties. Well, it does an awful lot for Jamaica's identity. Mm world at large. Should we open up to some questions? Um, what was the biggest challenge that you faced um, in the transition between moving between the music business and the hospitality business? And also, apart from the obvious, what are the differences and the similarities between the two industries? <coughs> well, the differences are, are that um, in the record business, if you have a hit, you can manufacture 50,000 records overnight. That's a big difference for the hotel business. If you have a hit, you can't manufacture any rooms, uh, you know, in under a year or, or two. Uh, <coughs> the other challenges are that um, when, you are, when you finish making a record, it stays like that. When you finish fixing up a room, a, a couple of months later, you walk in it and things have changed and things ha uh, and that, 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 that's the kind of thing which drives m me nuts from, <coughs> you know, because you spend a lot of time and you put things there and there and there and, uh, and then you, c uh, you come back and it's all kind of changed. So that's two of the main differences. I guess um, the other difference, which is something that I'm struggling with is how to work out, is that the great thing about the music business is people from any financial demographic can like the same thing. Uh, the hotel business is very much divided in financial demographics. So that's one which I'm trying to struggle with because I think if one can create an environment where there are wealthy people as well as people who are up and coming, who haven't achieved much yet, <coughs> but are going to, I think that sets a much more interesting dynamic. Because Jamaica is a place that's got two extremes of tourism yes. going on. Do you disapprove of the other form? The cruise ships, the all-inclusives? No, no, I, d I, d I don't uh, disapprove of them. It's not my thing at all, but I don't disapprove of it because if it hadn't been for the all-inclusives in the 70s when Jamaica had a very bad reputation, nobody would have gone to Jamaica at all. There is still a lot of fear, in, uh, and you talk to travel agents in the United States, there's still a lot of fear of sending people to Jamaica. Or, or I don't know whether they're so afraid, as, as, but their, uh, their uh, customers are. And also, Jamaica's often on the... Um, on the what do they call it when, when, when the America says you, you can't go to a Foreign place. advisory. It's yeah. the thing we don't like in right. this room, yeah. generally. Right. <laughs> so, so then you have to, to fight that. So the all-inclusives, sort of, people feel more comfortable in those. And it's a shame because until that has changed, I don't think Jamaica will ever f uh, uh, reach its potential. Well, here's hoping. I'd like to thank Chris Blackwell.
Thank you. A big round of applause for all of them. I think they've all been incredible speakers, and you know, as far as my, I'm concerned, I think I learned from all of you. <laughs> Hello, everyone. We hope you've enjoyed today's conference. Please don't forget that transfers are waiting for you to take you back to your appointed hotels, and we look forward to seeing you this evening at the party in the Palmeray. Bye. Thank you very much. <laughs>